Uh, my understanding is that tonight is normally a meeting that you have called the fishing group. Is that is that right? So uh, I, you know, we I don't think we really intended this to be a formal presentation of some sort. It was going to be and, and is going to continue to be uh, a discussion, <clears throat> sort of a let's talk about some things and, and do some brainstorming on the topic of fishing. Yes, on the topic of of evangelism. Um, but it's not really, a, uh, tomorrow we'll start some presentations, but not really tonight. <clears throat> so, I don't know. You, you guys can hear me okay back there, Pastor? Okay, that's good, because if the mic's not on, it doesn't sound so cavernous in here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> somebody tell me, in fact, several of you maybe tell me real quick, because uh, I haven't been to all these meetings about the fishing group. Fishing group, what, what is it? What are we doing? What are we working on? <clears throat> and then somewhere in there... Tell me what you'd like to maybe get out of our discussion tonight that has something to do with evangelism. Got any thoughts on that? So what is it, fishing group, what are you doing, what are you working on, and what is it that you'd really like to get out of tonight? Some question you want us to work on? Uh, I've got a whole bunch of stuff, but I, I kind of want some guidance from you as to where, where, what we're working on. So who wants to start us off with some of that? <clears throat> Apologize for the video. I'll try to repeat their comments and questions. <clears throat> Who's got something? What, how many times you guys met? Twice. Twice. Okay, so we're just getting warmed up. <clears throat> Two times. What's the purpose? To be a, um, a beacon in Uber. So, so the goal overall is to be a beacon, a, a light, uh, to, uh, to help out in the community. Okay, and but the purpose of this meeting is to figure out how to do that, or. Okay, so, so we're kind of trying to figure out how, how to be more effective at that. Yeah, meeting, we did a little bit of brainstorming. Okay. Ideas. A few of those ideas that popped out were what? <clears throat> Anybody remember any? Well, one, of the, one of the ideas was to um, use our community center to create a... Um, Okay. 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 So outreach for unwed pregnancy specifically, or teen um, pregnancy, or. Well, So a wide range of stuff. So, yeah, there were tons of different classes, and um, so one of the one of the things that we appreciated was um, they went when you were pregnant, you could go in, um, and you know they had the pregnancy center aspect of it, but it gave like um, classes to women who were pregnant, and and husbands were welcome as well. They had they had classes even geared just for men um, on how to be godly husbands and to be the head of the household. Um, so Gotcha. So really at the heart of it, it's, it's trying to serve and connect with young families, yes. new parents, uh, may, maybe single moms, yes. but, but not isolated. Okay. Yes. And, and uh, thoughts of doing that here in this facility? At, you said something about the teen center. Community. Oh, community center. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so another facility. All right. 
different, different something, something you're, you're working on. What is, the, what is the goal? What are you trying to figure out? And uh, uh, what's your thought on, on outreach and evangelism? <clears throat> Come on, Edie. You got one? I've been practicing your name. That's why I got to use it. <laughs> <clears throat> In the back, Rich. One of the things that uh, you guys and I went to another uh, outreach presentation by another church um, in Beaver, or, uh, another one in Portland. Another town. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, so let me just repeat the idea for the, for the video real quick. So the gist is to not just reinvent all the wheels. Uh, there might be many things already happening that we could get involved with in serving the individuals and not be... The nice thing about that is then we don't get bogged down all the time in all the wheels, right? And making the wheels and running the wheels. For instance, in our, in our town, there's a, a teen center. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they, they feed the kids uh, who apparently either don't have a home to go home to. Well, that's not totally true. A lot of them are mom and dad just aren't home to make the food or, or to feed them in the evenings or whatever. And so they can come there and they can get a meal and then we can interact with them and, and sort of. But, but it's not run by us. We, uh, the church doesn't run it. It's run by a community group and, and we can get involved there, and we have in the past, and sort of just come alongside, get involved with the wheel that's already going. Okay, any other thoughts? <clears throat> Either what you're working on or, yes? Um, we had started a prayer warriors group okay. with Ron Halverson's book. Okay. And we just had one meeting, so we're very fresh. So prayer time. Prayer yeah. time. Well, we're learning that, um, that there is a, a group here in our church. I mean, actually, I feel prayer is a foundation. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. So, so the word has to be in there, though. I know that. Well, and 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 that's you. You said that's just started, so that's just started it. okay. And and that meets already on a weekly basis, monthly it meets basis. Meets on Sabbath at okay. two o'clock, and it will be meeting this Sabbath. Okay. All right. Anything else that you guys have worked on so far? Yeah, Sherry. <clears throat> Okay. Just to give them a gift and connect with them. Good. So connecting them in small ways, loaves of bread. Pastor. Yeah, one of the things we also talked about was um, actually having small groups that were actually targeting specifically um, things that people like to do. That is like, you know, like some people like to golf. Well, then you need to get people together and say, hey, we're going to be golfing over the next three, four, five, six weeks, whatever it is. And, but use it as a, a way of having a commonality between people. Okay, so it's not just the three of us that know each other meeting and doing golf or canoeing, but trying to find people out in the community and pull them in, yeah. join them. Okay, yeah. good. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me just ask a couple of questions just because I, it's, I don't when was I here? Was it a year ago, John? I mean, we had a great time with the men's retreat, but that wasn't here. We went out on the coast, right? So about a year ago, and you had out here that really big um, sanctuary thing, right? Yeah, which was uh, brought in a lot of people, as I recall. Wasn't it like 500 uh, tours on the Saturday that I was here on Sabbath? We ended up with a total of 1,800. Tours. Okay, and, and of course, a lot of those might be Adventists, not necessarily from here at this church, but other towns, mm -hmm. but a lot non, right? <clears throat> right. What kind of follow-up did, did you all do with that? We tried. We tried. About, okay, well, what, I mean, tried what? Okay. And invited them to further get togethers, meetings. And How many requested that kind of. Uh, I don't remember the number. <laughs> was it 50, 20? Yeah, it was quite a few requests, but they, they were all over the board as to what they wanted. 
Okay. I thought there was a specific link for the sanctuary follow-up. That's what we were doing. Oh, to, to study more about the sanctuary? Yes. And did anybody, did you end up doing... Yeah, that's the one that was, we went around and um, everyone in the vicinity of Newburgh, we knocked on their door personally and gave them a personal invitation to come to the Bible study. If they okay. Had requested that. And, and, but not much came of it. Would you say that was because their interest uh, wasn't... So yeah, I mean, how would we sort of qualify at least a little bit as to what we learned from that? What is it because they weren't really interested or... They, 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 it was interesting because it was a big tent, but then when it was a knock on the door, it wasn't so interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm just guessing. I think we had it in June, <clears throat> and July was our camp meeting. And so because there was... Uh, there was a bit of a time gap. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There was a gap. Too much of a time gap. You, you got to strike when it's fresh, and, and <laughs> we, we tried. I mean, that was the, our idea, but it didn't work out. Okay, okay. Just curious, because that was, I mean, I, I saw a lot of people here, and I didn't know, uh, you know, how many of them were actually normally here as your members and how many weren't. I was just watching, right, the whole thing. Uh, but I was just curious about that. If we had a chance to do it over, I think we would do it a different way. But, yeah. <laughs> the follow-up, you'd do a different way? Oh. And, uh, and that dialogue is still ongoing. That isn't a thing where that's come to a... Totally fall. finished. <clears throat> yeah, that's still kind of all... In fact, um, fully intend to talk about this series maybe with her. And, you know, she's working now, so tonight wasn't even on the scope. But, you know, the weekend, obviously. So, you know, again, it'll be, you know, it'll, the, the intro will be, you know, that... Messiah's Mansion. Yeah. Well, one of the speakers that was here during that time. Right, right. He's actually holding it up, you know. <laughs> so, so I'm not, I'm not really ready to Good. pitch that out necessarily because some of those things do take a little longer, you know. Very good it's point. Not my time to get the job. Rich. Jen, not to uh, burst pop, my pop bubble. that balloon. <laughs> Good. And that's, I think that's really the point. Exactly. Well, point <laughs> and, and, you know, as far as good things coming out of it, we had a, a young man from the church who was so impressed with the other young men <laughs> the, that were what they were doing <laughs> in Messiah's Mansion that he wanted to go to their school. He ended up going to their so school. He, so he's in Oklahoma going to school. Going to school. And, and doing very well. And he, and did, his did, first, his first, he did do his first Messiah's Mansion. Tour. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. oh, good. <laughs> okay, well, that just kind of gives me a quick catch up on a, probably a lot more info from the year, but at least gives me an idea, uh, idea of what you're working on as a group, what the purpose of this meeting is for. Um, and so let me, let me um, start tossing a few ideas out there for you to bounce around. Again, the, the idea is to have a discussion on these things. Um, but uh, the hard... The hard uh, reality as a church, and I don't mean just Newburgh, I mean Adventism, which, by the way, I was born and raised into. I didn't, when I was here before, I didn't share a whole lot of my testimony, but I was born and raised. Uh, I was raised at Andrews, born in California, but moved to Andrews when I was less than one. So all the way through to 30 years old, that's, that's where I lived. <clears throat> my dad took a couple sabbaticals in between there, so I got to... Uh, live in a few other places, but most of it was done done there. And I think last time I, I shared a little bit of my personal testimony in regards to when I was a teenager, I was struggling because it seemed that what I was reading about in the stories wasn't happening to me. Meaning, when you read about Peter, James, and John, you know, it wasn't happening to me, and it wasn't happening to my friends, and it wasn't happening to any adults around me that I could really figure out either. And so I had this really big question. Why was it all so <clears throat> different? Why was it all so empty? Why was it not like the stories in the Bible? Anybody else notice that? Even in our evangelism, 
I mean, we, we don't like to be negative. That's a good thing. I don't want to be negative. We're not going to spend this weekend throwing stones and being negative. But we might be a little bit honest about a few things, like the fact that we uh, spend a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of effort, and it seems that there's just not what we read about in the book of Acts. And I don't mean 3,000 in a day. That's an amazing story. But you also notice they don't repeat that day in and day out, right? I mean, they wouldn't have been able to accommodate the, the training and learning of that many people if you had that every weekend. So that isn't the point. The point isn't quantity. <clears throat> the point is what? Holy Spirit power. Not, not just power to do miracles, and I say just, meaning that's the small thing, but power for hearts really to comprehend and understand, to really be filled and delighted with the Lord or so in angered against it that they're ready to go to war against it. Because there was both, right? I mean, Pentecost, the days afterwards, <clears throat> thrown in prison, all that stuff. But, but, but my, my question is, is, if we're honest, isn't, shouldn't we look around and, and say, what, what is, why is it so not like that? Any thoughts on that? I'm going to start you off with a real hard reading here. And this one comes from, let me just give me a second to get to it because I have a bunch here. This one comes from a Signs of the Times article <clears throat> that Ellen White wrote, December 22, 1890. And I'm not going to read lots of it. I'm going to give you this little piece. You could jot that down. Uh, hopefully you have access to actually read more of this whole story later, this whole picture. But here's what it says, and this is what I want you to talk about with me for just a few minutes. There is a sad withholding from God on the part of his professed people. This is why the Lord cannot impart to his church the fullness of his blessings as he longs to do. One more time. This is why the Lord cannot impart to his church the fullness of his blessings that he longs to do. To honor them, that is his church, to honor them in a distinguished manner before the world or in front of the world would be to put his seal upon their works. Just got to let that sink for a minute. To honor them in a distinguished manner, that's <clears throat> referring to marked manifestations of the power of God, whether it be pillar of fire or whether it be tongues of fire, whether it be miracles or whether it be heart conversions and baptism they're all part of that same thing to honor us in that distinguished manner in front of our neighbors would be to put his seal upon our works comma confirming our false representations of God's character that that's a tough one to read just so we can be honest with ourselves and say <clears throat> we tend we tend to try to find ways to fix it. We tend to try to find ways to accomplish something, to do a work for God, to really bring the people in. Uh, and we come up with many ways, very creative, uh, come up with lots of lists and lots of ideas. But when I read this, it sort of just takes a shotgun to everything I've been doing. I don't know how you feel about it, but it's kind of how I feel about it. This is why the Lord cannot impart to his church the fullness of his blessings as he longs to do. Now, I got to grab that part just a little bit. I love the fact that it says that he longs to do. So this isn't about us trying to earn something from him or talk him into it or, or, or convince him. How long has he been wanting to impart the fullness of his blessings on the Advent people? 1844? 1844? Certainly since 1888, we might talk a little bit about that Saturday evening at the meeting, but, but just the gist of it, he's longed to do it for a long time. In fact, what's our Bible verse for that? The idea of him longing to give it to us. Higher than the highest human thought, uh, Okay. That's talking about his greatness and his goodness, but specifically on his wanting to impart the manifestations of his power. I want to write my law upon their hearts. That, that, of course, is the, the saving goal, right? In other words, if he writes his law in our hearts, he's, he's rescued us from the very thing that's destroying us. And that's important. That's good. Or 
or hope or think, okay, that's, that's pointing to how vast it is, right? And so that's, that's definitely one. And what about the one with the, you who are evil know how to give good gifts? I mean, that, that's sort of a, a, a toss it on top of us, right? Because wait a minute, <laughs> we, we long to give good gifts to our children, don't you? And if we who are evil have that longing, and then Jesus adds, how much more then? Oh, oh wow. Right? So even if I got just like this much longing to give my kids good gifts, then how much more is his longing? That's, that's a connection. Go ahead. Malachi, the one that talks about our, the storehouse being poured out. Okay. Us, but I, not just the money. You know, we think of the tithe sure. totally with that. But I think of the total surrender of the person. Good. The yielding, the dying to self. The blessings of his presence <laughs> that helps us die to self in the first place, right? Okay, so let me go on a little more. To honor, uh, the honor them, the church in this distinguished manner before the world, would be to put his seal upon our works and confirming our false representations of his character. Obviously, that last line is the biggest part. That's why we're working on the subject all weekend, right? Then it goes on to say, just a little more, when the church shall come out from the world and be separate from it, and I want some feedback on this, come out from the world and be separate from its maxims, its habits and its practices. Then the Lord Jesus will work with his people. What are its maxims? I'm not asking you to solve all that right this minute. We're going to work on this all weekend. Habits. The world's habits. What, are, what is that? And its practices. And then she adds, but his blessings cannot be, be bestowed, right, not delivered to us in their fullness, while we are so corrupted with the spirit and the practices of the world. That's probably enough of that one for tonight. <laughs> not, not because it's not valuable, not because it's not important, but, but it, does, it does bring us this question, why are the heavens uh, sealed up? Why is it not raining any rain? We look around us and we wonder at the dry dust under our feet, and yet we work hard to try to figure out how to get the rain to come down, right? But it says the heavens are sealed up on us. Did you know that? On us, the Advent people, the heavens have been shut up, and they are like iron that they rain no rain. Why is that? You're saying the majority, I mean, you're saying the group as a, because it's really individual, your relationship okay. with Okay. Have you tried that? <laughs> <laughs> and that's important because we talk groups, because we live in groups, we work in groups, and we think in groups, and yet Elijah had it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the story where we see the heavens shut up, closed up, right? So <clears throat> the idea that it is shut up and closed up is really pointing to what? Where, where, where is the problem? It's our heart, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the only one that can shut up the heaven on me for my life. In fact, the heavens don't really shut up or close up because the rain is continuous. Isn't God's presence always there? Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is that someone taught us we need to go outside with an umbrella so we don't get wet. When what we need to understand is we need that umbrella gone so we can stand in the full outpouring of his rain. Right? So that's a good point. Individual is important. Because there's no way you're going to fix it in groups. Even God can't fix it in groups, right? Jesus comes to Israel. I mean, it's a, it's a tough story. He's got to flip over tables. How would we respond to that if he did that in here Sabbath morning? Well, you have Jeremiah and Isaiah, and you have all the ones talking about constantly saying, you need to repent, 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 because you're turning to the world. You're turning to paganism. Okay. And he said the things that are going on today, we're being totally maxed out with being propaganda. <laughs> okay. And, and, and so if we fall into the maxims, what were those three words? Maxims, customs, and habits, right? Of the world, it's going to take a little work to figure out what that might be, but if we fall into those, suddenly our hearts are closed up against the rain that he wants to bring, that he's pouring, but we are not receiving. Go ahead. Well, I was just thinking that maxims to me means uh, 
words to live by. Words to live by. Philosophies. Philosophies. Et cetera, that's all out there in the world that we have battled against because so much of it's just based on selfishness and greed. The, the Israelites were doing that in the time of Jesus, right? And what, what I mean by that is not just a light sort of look at that, but, but actually they were right in the temple teaching what? Their ideas, their laws, their rules, right? And so you could take those three things, maxims, habits, and what was the other one? Practices. practices customs, practices. And, and, and that's what was going on. That's what Jesus came to clean up. And, and what's amazing is I look at the history of things, <clears throat> And I'm talking about our history, Advent history. Uh, when you look at that history, it, it's really shocking how much we have closed, closed, closed the doors to the directions the Lord wants to go. And now we're so far away from it. Has anybody ever heard of 1888 by the time you graduated high school? If you went to church school? And I don't mean, we're not going to spend time this weekend re-dredging up, you know, all the details about 1888. I've, I've seen, I, I watch some people do that, and it just comes a whole new sort of level of confusion. We're going to refer to it, though, this weekend, when you're, you know, you have more people here and your other guests and so on, in this context of, of the rebellion at the Jordan River, right? Remember, they sent in the spies, had to check it out, and, and, and they come back and they say, there is no way, right? There's no way. Only two of them said that, hey, trust the Lord, it can be done. She, Ellen White, acquaints that story with us and our experience. And I have looked. I have read through all the letters written to different individuals through the whole time from 1888 to her death, looking for any sign that she said, ah, finally we turned around. Don't find it. And then we go to the evidence of what's happening in our lives. And, and start really digging into the question of what are those customs and maxims and practices, and we're going to find all kinds of evidence that says that we're still in the exact same rebellion, right? So this is, this is what the Lord wants to turn around for us. Go ahead, Ken. I'm going to read something out of Galatians, because okay. it goes really with just what we're talking about. He says, listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ cannot help you. Okay. Try it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, which you can insert any word in there, right? It's yep. Words. But anyway, you must obey all of the regulations of the whole law of Moses. For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive everything promised to us who are right with God through faith. For when we place our faith in Christ Jesus, it makes no difference to God whether we are circumcised or not circumcised. What is important is faith expressing itself in true love. And I like what he says here. You were getting along so well. <laughs> who has interfered with you? Good. Now you're getting to the heart of the matter, because isn't it true? And, and maybe, so, anybody here really dug into the history of 88? Just so I'm curious, okay. Uh, when you, good, Pastor Ed. When you really dig into it, isn't it true, those of you that have looked into it, that the bottom line became more, of, not, not so much about a theological debate of law, but rather the spirit in which we operated working with one another, or should I say warring with one another, Right? That, that's really what came in. When I look at all those letters that she wrote and all the, the things that are uh, now available to us to, to read of, of what she gives of the account of what happened, what came in was a spirit of pride, a spirit of contentions. That's what I was looking for, sort of contentions and fighting, not getting along over what? Little theological debates. And I don't mean that theology isn't important. Theology helps us, correct theology helps us understand the truth about God, which is what we're going to spend most of our time on this weekend, just to understand the truth about God. But we have to grasp at the beginning of this weekend that what wrecked it all was, well, I'm, I'm going to contend with you just because I don't agree with the way you said that. that that's really what it was. And the fights got so big that, that they're tearing each other down uh, and, and she writes again and again, like uh, we just read um, all the letters. I took all the letters written to Uriah Smith, 
just his, that Ellen White wrote, and said, Let's, let, let me read all those. And this time I, I read them, just last week, I read them in reverse order. So the, the, the one she wrote last, and so on and so on backwards. I just wanted to see how it looked that way. <laughs> Go ahead, Pastor, in the back. Okay. I remember hearing a story about a lady who was driving her nice brand new beautiful car down down the road, sixty miles an hour, and she was concerned about a speck over on the passenger side on the dash. So she was busy trying to wipe the speck off the dash because <laughs> Smithereens, yep. And, and, I, and I think the, the avenue of 1888, at least the stuff that I have looked at, when I've looked at it, I've tried to understand what it is. And what I, come, what I come away with is that when we lose sight of the mission, when we lose sight of, of an experience of, of the Holy Spirit guidance mm -hmm. and empowerment, and we look towards self-ambition and our own purposes, and we start judging other people based upon what we see, what we think, and we, we pull away. It's like reaching over for that speck instead of paying attention to the road. And so the priorities is what I'm getting at. The priorities are messed up. Those people wouldn't say that the Holy Spirit necessarily wasn't important or all those things, but the priorities were flip-flopped. So they were focusing on the wrong thing. Okay, good. And like, like the speck on the dash. Instead of the deer or the whatever it was, horse or something on the road. Um, that, that's a great illustration. So, what, what, again, what that's pointing us to is if we're focusing on the wrong thing, now, and I'm just going to be honest about my life, myself. I, I, and, and it could have been entirely just me. Maybe it was just my defects of character. But, but I, I sort of kind of remembered my teenage years and kind of growing up years that, that I, I had this very uh, focused look out on the world that said, boy, it's too bad that they don't have me there to help them understand what is truth. I remember uh, being on the hillside at a campground in uh, Pennsylvania. There was, they were having an event there called the Creation Fest. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a musical event. Um, lots of music, music that I, I, I didn't listen to. I was raised a good Adventist. I don't listen to that stuff. And, and I remember standing on the back of that hill. There was probably like 8,000 people out there, or, or 10, <clears throat> and thinking that exact thing to myself that I just said. Oh, it's a terrible thing, all, all these poor people here who, who don't have an Adventist here to explain to them the truth. I literally thought that. That's terrible, right, for me to think like that. Because that's what? The man who stood in the temple and said, Thank you, Lord, that I am not like those people. That's what that was. So the point the pastor just brought up is that, again, we, we get all focused on the speck, and Jesus did talk about the beam sticking out my eye, but I didn't really have any interest in looking at that <laughs> because I could see all these 10,000 specks, right? And we approach our evangelism in such a way. We, we want to get people together, and then we want to uh, warn them about all those other evil programs out there. And, and we spend so much time talking about all that other stuff out there, what's wrong with this and that and the other thing and the other thing, and do we ever get around to... Let me, let me just read some, some, some good stuff now. <laughs> this is describing Jesus. Watch Jesus, because here's our question on the screen. That's such a nice thing you got up there. I like that. Is that, is that from the film Jesus? He's down right in the sand? What is that? I think so, yeah. <clears throat> I think it's from that Matthew video. Listen to this. It says, Jesus did not suppress one word of truth. So he didn't hide anything. But he uttered it always in what? Love. Love. He exercised the greatest tact. That's an interesting word. Greatest tact. Uh, thoughtful, kind attention in his intercourse with people. He was never rude. Never? Never rude. Never needlessly spoke a severe word. Never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. I mean, again, already I was wrecking my whole evangelistic program here. <laughs> he, okay, yeah, let me give it to you. This is uh, from uh, Steps to Christ, page 12. Yeah, 12. 
never rude, never spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. I thought that's what we're supposed to do, is point out to everybody what's wrong with them. <laughs> Did not censor human weakness. He spoke the truth, but always in love. Now, now, here we go. He denounced hypocrisy. How did he do that? If, if everything we just read stays intact, how did he denounce hypocrisy? <laughs> that's the amazing part. I keep wanting to jump to the woes of the Pharisees part of the story. Right? But the way he really did it was by what he was, how he was, it was rebuking hypocrisy all over the place by itself. By itself. Well, he, was speaking in, in his parables. he denounced unbelief. How did he do that one? You remember a story where he did that, denounced unbelief? The disciples are in the boat. Oh, yeah. And he says, Peter. He says, uh, did, uh, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees. And what'd they say? Bread. Yeah. <laughs> Who brought the bread? And Jesus says, oh, ye of little. That, but so gentle, he says it. You know, I'm expecting some big club to really, like, knock them out of the boat. So, ge <laughs> so gentle, he says, oh, of little, ye of little faith, right? He puts it in front of them, puts it there. There is a need there. There's a crisis there. They don't really listen. They don't really trust. They don't really believe. But so gentle Jesus is with it. And he does this for how long? Every day for three and a half years, right? And they're still not getting it. I mean, probably the, the, one of the things that really bring tears to my eyes because I know that it probably where there's ways I'm doing it and I haven't learned yet. But here they were the night before he's going to die and they're, they're in the upper room with him and they have this feast and whatnot. And after he gets done with the bread and the wine and the foot washing, what are they doing? Who's in charge around here? Who gets to be the boss? Yeah. <laughs> Who gets to be in charge? They, they, they love the topic of being in charge. Who gets the power is the, is the ultimate question. Who gets to have the, the authority to command around here? That, they love that topic. Go ahead. Okay. But they did not receive the Holy Spirit because they were not... Took some time. Yet. Yeah. So it wasn't until they received it that the deeper things, the deeper meaning. Yes. Otherwise, they were just getting the milk, and that wasn't enough. They needed the meat. That's right. And, and Jesus was trying to give it to them. That's why he was praying for them, though. And that's why we need to pray for... I, I'm really... I believe prayer is really a... Let, let's work on it just for a minute, because that is an important subject, not just for you, but for all of us. Uh, when you think about Jesus working with disciples, as I'm just talking about, where do you see them praying to him? To him? To him, Jesus. You don't. <laughs> you don't? You don't see them praying to him? He said when he gave his example of prayer, it was to pray to his father. Okay, okay. He told them to pray to, to Father, right? To Abba, Father, or Daddy. But you don't see the, them anywhere praying to Jesus? Not staying not awake. Really. And they did not. The thing about their prayers, if they did pray, yeah. <laughs> that I did not see, is that um, they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. Good. And I think that's a part that we need to do. Okay. We, we think we know how to pray. But that's not true. We need to be taught on a daily basis how to pray or what to pray for. Okay, that's why we have the Holy Spirit to help us, right? That's why we have the Holy Spirit. And it is true that the disciples watching Jesus were so amazed watching him come out of prayer. They'd look at that and they'd go, man, we want to know how to do that. How'd you do that? That is true. But I want you to just expand your, your thought just a little bit further to watch them pray every single day. No. They would say, Lord, what did that parable mean? Lord, Lord, do you know that the Pharisees didn't like it when you did that? You shouldn't have done that. Do you ever pray like that? Tell the Lord, you know, what's wrong with his program and how it's working? The interaction, the relationships was the one of steady. Yes. The, the, what, what I want you to grasp is what happened to the disciples is they followed him and every day they were watching, listening. Doesn't mean they were understanding yet, right? But they were watching and listening. They were, they were submerged 
in the activity of beholding who? God Almighty, the Heavenly Father's representative, the one who would help them understand. And it is true, and, we, and it's important for us to see all those ways that they were slow and, and they didn't get it because that's me, right? That's us. And that helps us to know he's willing to work with us the same way he worked with Peter, James, and John. But at the same time, let's not miss the fact that Jesus knew as long as they're coming, as long as they're asking questions, as long as they're learning, he knew that that's what real prayer was. Amen. Real prayer was not telling Jesus, you know, that part where they say, you shouldn't have done that because the Pharisees didn't like that. that. That's not helpful prayer because that's trying to run the program. That's trying to tell God how to do the program. That's not, not helpful or useful. What he needs is for us to what? Open our hearts for him to work his work in us instead of us working our work. Go ahead, Pastor. Pastor. You're right. And so it ignited a whole new emphasis for their positions. But the problem was their positions they were looking at were from the standpoint of an earthly kingdom. Right. What they didn't understand was what the kingdom of God is. Because they were looking at the, at the, at the kingdom of man seed. Right. That's that maxims, customs, and what was the third one? <laughs> I can't get all three of those. For sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Gabriel. Same thing. And that, that's a great story because that is kind of where I grew up, meaning out there in that field wondering, man, what, what happened? How did this, how did we get here? But, but, but connecting back to the, the heart of the matter which is really having to do with our heart change that, that actually God was trying to get through to even in Gideon's time, it's this. While Jesus denounced hypocrisy and unbelief, this is where I finished off, right, and iniquity, we have to understand that there were tears in his voice as he uttered those scathing rebukes. There's no room for critical, condemning, judgmental, I'm better than thou. I'm unwilling to humble myself and apologize. There's no room for, well, but that pastor or that elder or that whoever won't just do it the way I think they should, and that's the problem. There's no room for that. It says, he wept over Jerusalem, the city that he loved. What city? <laughs> Isn't that the dirty, rotten city that was going to crucify him? He wept over Jerusalem, the city that he loved, which refused to receive him the way, the truth, and the life. They had rejected him, the Savior, but he regarded them with pitying tenderness. See, that's not what's usually in our hearts. 
when, when we're trying to figure out how to help those people. Right? On the other side, yes, go ahead. You have to remember that he did keep saying in the Old Testament, remember who I am. I am the creator God. And if you love me, keep my commandments. Understand the, the power that I have. Don't put yourself up here. I mean, maybe it was all done in love, and it was. Because it was the same Jesus back there, right? But he was telling them he was all powerful. So that's why this paragraph starts, he did not suppress one word of truth. See, this isn't about him just skipping over the hard things to say. It's telling me how he said them. My neighbor, right, who is in major crisis of sin. Do we just say, well, I guess that's what they want, what they got. See you later. No, there needs to be a rescue. There needs to be a rescue attempt. There needs to be a way to say what needs to be said. But the most crucial part is the heart in which you say it. Seven times. That's why it says next, his life, Jesus's life was one of self sacrifice, sacrifice denial is what it says here. Same thing, right? And, and thoughtful care of others. Wow. Self-denial and thoughtful care of others. Every soul was so precious in his eyes. While he ever bore himself with divine dignity, that means at peace and at rest, Never ruffled, never frustrated, never got bent out of shape, right? All that stuff. He bowed with the tenderest regard to every member of the family of God. Wow. Now, who did that include? Everybody. Those annoying people. Yeah, because we, we often like to get right to that spot and go, okay, that's just us, right? Our little group. Every member of the family of God. Not that they were converted that way into the family of God, but that they were his children. And he longed to rescue them in all, because it says in the next line, in all men he saw fallen souls, there it is, whom it was his mission to save. And what was he going to have to do to save them? Yeah, give his whole life. See that blessing that he wants to pour out? It's not until we're willing to come there that he can pour it out. Not, not until then. Go ahead, Ken. It's hitting hard, this vignette that, that Jesus gave us with his, with his 12, right? He, he takes three of them and says, okay, we're going up for something special, right? So the nine that are left, 
They're all looking at each other. Grumping. Well, okay, we've got to start talking about from, you know, 9 through 12 then. Because obviously 1 through 3 is taken. <laughs> That's right. right? So, but, but, but if you look at that story, what Jesus really did was the greater blessing was for the nine left behind. Right. Because what were they going to do? What did you just say Jesus did? Self-sacrifice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, what was his mission for him? I mean, you know, and, and they come back down the mountain, and there's this big uproar, and the demon can't get kicked out, and right. that kind of stuff. And, and Jesus takes care of it, and, you know, handles it, and they move on, and they're walking down the road, Jesus goes, so what were you guys talking about back there? I mean, which had just taken place just before he got there. Right. They were arguing about who was going to be first. That's and, right. You know, Again. Kind of look, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And they all kind of look at each other going. Which, know, which we're doing? still doing, right? Yeah. We're still caught up right now in this huge argument about who gets to be in charge. Yeah. Okay. So, he, so later on then, he pulls them aside and he says, look, here's a, here's a little child. And, and if you want to be the greatest, you know, maybe they start to get it. No, because the next day, <laughs> children come to Jesus and they're like shooing them away. Yeah, that's right. So he did say, right, to be the greatest, you have to be the servant of all. This, this is what he's waiting for us Adventists to get. I mean, not just waiting as in idly waiting. No, he's, he's coming at us from every angle he can get to get us to get it. But we got to just be honest and say, this is what's holding things up. This is what has the heavens shut up, closed up like iron, right? Just wanting us to say, you know what, forget about in charge, in control, uh, me over somebody. This has nothing to do with any of that. This is about me being willing to give my entire life to God to be spent at his command. To serve and wash feet where he says to do it. Listen to this. And then I'm actually going to quit. And I'm going to ask Charlie to come up here in just a minute. Listen to this. The words, this is from Ministry of Healing, chapter 9, uh, page 143. Uh, it says, the world needs today exactly what it needed 2,000 years ago. A revelation of Jesus Christ. A great work of reform is now needed or demanded, it says here. And it is only through the grace of Christ that works that, uh, that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual, can be accomplished. And then here's the little gem tucked in here. Christ methods alone, right? You guys read this one, I think, a couple weeks ago. Christ methods alone will give true success, success in reaching the people. The Savior, here's his success, here's his methods. The Savior mingled among people as one who desired what? They're good. Not there for his good. Not there for what I'm going to get out of it, for how many points I'm going to get, for how many baptisms I'm going to get. Not there for that. Not there so we can say our pews are packed. The Lord, the Lord can fill these pews by tomorrow morning or next week if he wants. The problem is until we are ready to be completely emptied of self and serve them, how, what good is it going to be for him to bring them? Old Testament says this, it'll be like 10 strong men grab onto you. I mean, this is a weird, this is an interesting idea for evangelism. Like 10 strong men grab onto you and say, take us to Jehovah. We can tell you know him. That's what it says. That's how it's going to be in the last days. You're not going to have to go knocking on any doors. I'm not saying don't knock on doors. I'm not saying don't go out and find the people. What I'm saying is that when we are transformed into his likeness, the hungry will flock to get food. Amen. But if we serve up moldy bread, they will not come. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. That's three very, very big steps. I'm going to come back real quick, and then I'm going to stop. Ken said, don't pitch it out yet or whatever. <laughs> There's a family, because uh, we want to do just a few minutes of practical things here. There's a family who, at our church, he's now the head elder, actually. We've been working on this subject uh, with our personal ministries time and, and our evangelistic uh, uh, sort of learning time at church. And, and the head elder, he did uh, an amazing thing. A few, uh, actually, the story goes back at least two years, but I'm not going to go back that far. About nine months ago, his neighbor called him up 
and it was snow on the driveway and whatnot, and they live on kind of a steep hill. And he said, our car just isn't really safe to take down this hill. Would you take us to church? That's a, not an Adventist neighbor. He was asking the Adventist at the time, and not held, head elder, but elder, to take him to church. You know what day? Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. Wait a minute, is that legal? <laughs> The head elder and his wife drove down, <coughs> took them to church. It was like 45-minute drive. Ooh, they're locked in the car now. 45-minute <laughs> drive there and 45 minutes back. And, of course, they just heard a sermon that, guess what? Now, now the discussion is going to be happening. And the elder has learned not to pounce on every little wrong thing you can find, all the little specks on the dashboard, but to wait, wait till the conversation comes to a big important one, like who is Jesus? And, and what, is, what is salvation? And what is, what is the work that Christ can do in our hearts? Can he or can he not rescue us from sin, right? They're just stuff that's deeper and more important. And, and, and he just sort of works that a little bit. <clears throat> but then uh, weeks go by, and, and, and then there's another conversation, and then another conversation. And then pretty soon we're having this thing. Uh, we just had a seminar was kind of informative, meaning it wasn't, so I wouldn't call it evangelistic in the sense of gospel-centered, but it was informative. It was about uh, Islam and Christianity and what's the mindset of, of Islam religion and the people in it and what's the difference between the extremist and, and maybe the, the regular mainstream. And anyway, the neighbors came to that. And I thought, uh, this isn't that interesting. I wonder if they're going to come back. They came back every time. Why? Because they're riding with the Adventist now head elder. And they're having conversations all the way there and all the way back. And then at, during the seminar, the pastor's saying, okay, and, and after this, we're going to have uh, a Daniel seminar. Not, not a Daniel Revelation seminar. It's not, not an amazing facts thing. It's, it's just we're going to work through the book of Daniel, a chapter at a time. We're going to read it together and study it. And, of course, we're wondering, you know, when we spend $25,000 on the seminar, we might get four afterwards, right, or something like that. And we're wondering, you know how many signed up for this? Eleven people that weren't Adventists. And I thought, wow. You know why? Because the members have started to learn that their job is ministry. Not their job they go to work to get paid at. Their job is ministry. Their calling is ministry. They're called by God to be kind and gracious and gentle. We're learning that when you walk in Walmart, the, the smiles that you give, the handshakes you get, that's ministry, at least the beginning of it. And the story sometimes is long. See, that's two years that this uh, elder has been sort of ministering to his neighbors. And now his neighbors are saying, well, what do you think about this going on in the world? And what do you think about that? And all these like, well, you know, how would you ever get to that stuff if you're just trying to accomplish it all in a couple weeks? Because it takes time to love people. It takes time to minister to them. And, and, and programs that are going, you know, like uh, our, our sister in the back there, I didn't get her name, but, you know, for, for ministering to, the, to those that really are struggling and need help, that is a, a, the right place to be doing it. But understand, the ministry is not the activity. The ministry is, are you filled with Christ? Because if you aren't, you can't pass it out. You can't share it. You can't give it. I'm going to ask Charlie for a few minutes to come join me because Charlie um, <clears throat> is one of our church members who in the past uh, two, three years, I forget now, has been sort of learning and experiencing some of this same stuff. Here, let me give him the microphone. This is just for video. <laughs> uh, and, and, and he's just going to tell you a couple things about what he's been experiencing. Okay, well, I'm looking at them back there. Well, I'm here, and I'm listening to Bobby, and uh, it's taking me up and down mountains and just thinking about my past. I'm not a speaker. I am a pew person, but <laughs> I guess I've lived the life of the knock on the door it's a make it or break it right there. And I guess I've lived my life that way. And so 
I've just got a, a little picture of something a lot better and a lot bigger and a lot more fun. But it wasn't anything that I did. It was giving up. So let me just, <laughs> let me just share some experiences that happened to me. Um, about uh, six, uh, probably eight months ago, I said, I've been wanting to do, uh, do Bible studies for my whole life. I just love people. I love meeting people. I'm not scared of it unless I'm up front. <laughs> I just really like small groups and, and knowing people. But understand that I have this background of thinking that you've got to have it right and get it done right there on the spot. And getting to the heart of, am I really loving people? This is something I'm learning. Was I really loving people when I was going there and studying in my mind? Okay, so when somebody asks me, so why should I keep the Sabbath? What should I tell them? Those are questions that would go through my mind. And I'd think about that. I've, I've actually thought that my whole life. And in Bobby's words, isn't that sad? I mean, maybe that is the question, but let me tell you why that's sad. Just about um, probably uh, four months ago, I came, uh, I took the kids on a walk. My wife was in a meeting, and as they took this walk with me, trying to keep the noise down and the me from the meeting, we walk back in the door, and just as we walk in, I hear the phone ringing, and you know, I uh, did what everybody should do. It's somebody else's job. Somebody get the phone! <laughs> and nobody seemed to listen. They just, I don't even remember if anybody even looked at me. I'm like, somebody get the phone. I said it a little bit louder, not demanding, just I'm concerned because I don't want this phone call to go away. It's somebody might, might need something. And so I decide that it must be me to get the phone. So I run down the hall and I hear it go past me, ring, 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 ring. So I turn around, skid in there, and I say, call Vlad Adventist Church, how can I help you? <laughs> Without, I, I, I was expecting it to be dead because it rang a long time. And the guy on the other end says, yeah, um, I've been listening to your radio station and I've got a question for you. And kind of a neutral tone of voice. And I really wasn't sure, is this, good? Or is this bad? <laughs> you know, because people can be offended by radio, you know, grant it. So I said, yeah, I can, I can help you. What, what's your question? He said that, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Friday night, Saturday, what do you call that thing again? <laughs> and I was, I was like, not sure if he was serious, but I, I said, uh, Sabbath? And he said, yes, that. I want to know how to keep the Sabbath. <laughs> I spent my whole life studying the wrong question. What was the wrong question again? Say it one more time. The wrong question is how to convince somebody that they should keep the Sabbath. When the real question is, how do I keep the Sabbath? I never even studied that. I didn't even occur to me that that is the question. But then, what do you say? Anybody have a thought? What would you say? <laughs> Since you've thought about it longer than me. <laughs> yeah. Don't work. Anything else? Set aside the cares of the world. Set aside the cares of the world. What? God created man for the Sabbath? Yeah. Or created the Sabbath for man. He said it's good to do good on the Sabbath. Well, all I could think of was this. Going down the list. All I could think of were the rules that we've set up, that we have set up. And I was like, how could I do that to somebody? How could I give them a list that they check off and say, okay, yeah, now I've kept the Sabbath. And so I said, I don't know where this came from because I did not study this. Did not. But I just said, 
maybe it came from Bobby. I might have overheard him saying something. I don't know. But I just said, oh. you know, the Pharisees kept the Sabbath very well. They knew the Sabbath better than anybody in the world. And yet they crucified the Lord of the Sabbath. And then I don't know what came over me, but I just, because I said, well, would you be interested in talking about this a little bit? Just get together and maybe study it out a little? And then there was this slight moment of silence that to me was 10 minutes. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I said the wrong thing. <laughs> and then he said, sure, I'd love to. And so I've been studying the Bible with this guy, and it's not been the typical Let's just start at the top of this study and we're going to go through and prove these points and create a list that now let's just check off this doctrine and this doctrine and this doctrine so that finally when we're done, we have kept the Sabbath. We have kept the, the doctrines of this and this that we have deemed as more important than the other doctrines, which are the love of Jesus, the character of God. What has he come here to do for us? What can we do to empty ourselves of self to introduce somebody to Jesus, and uh, that's just one story. I've got a lot, but trust me. I don't know how long you... Tell another one. Okay. So, the next week. Um, it was one week later. I had uh, somebody just call me up out of the blue, and he said, hey, uh, Uh, oh, I, I got a message. He said, would you be interested in going on a, a Bible study? I got your name from the pastor, and he, he wondered if you'd be willing to go out and um, study with me. He's kind of more in your neck of the woods, and we could uh, go out together. I'd introduce you, and I listened to the message. I was like, yeah, I called him back. Sure, I'd love to do that. We drive up to the door, we knock on the door of this person that I, I didn't know. He opens the door, and this is somebody that I had actually studied with, or not studied with. Somebody just came to my office out of the blue. I make websites. I have this tiny cubicle of an office. It's just me. <laughs> but he came by, and we were talking, and we just went to the depths of our soul, like emptied the deepest things, and just shared about God and what he's done for us and our struggles. And it was this guy that I talked with an hour and a half, and he's standing there in front of me, and I'm going to have Bible studies with him. <laughs> and the guy I'm with that was introducing me, I just kind of walked past him, and I'm like, I give him a big hug and call him by name, and he's like, did I miss something? This is a little <laughs> fast. He's like, this is a little fast. You know, typically we don't walk that, start hugging people <laughs> on the first time. But I'm just telling you, it's... It's incredible. And now I've been studying with him for a while, and I've waited my whole life scared to do this because I thought I had to have all the answers. I guess the perfectionist in me, I, maybe nobody else is like that. I just, yeah, right. I don't, you know, I didn't want to be wrong. But then, what is that? Yeah. Not trusting. Not trusting, pride. And to realize that I don't have to be afraid of that. It's not me. Stop. It's not me talking. You are reminding me that on our drive. I'm just God uses the weakest people, the people that I don't have words. I seriously do not have words. My sister got all of them. She's a <laughs> she's a professional writer, and I am not. I, yeah. When I realized what was on the phone there, what you were saying, I was like, everybody out, close the door. I'm like, I got to take this call. I've waited my whole life for this. I just was like, I cannot believe this is happening. I was thinking about Amos um, 3, 7, I think it was, or something, about how the plow plowman 
will overtake the reaper. When God sends people to you that you didn't even ask for, you didn't even know they existed, and yet all you did was say, I'm willing to be a hand, I'm willing to be a foot, I can't even talk, I don't want to talk, I can't believe I'm standing here, sitting, because I'm scared to stand, but it's okay, you know, I'm, I don't have to worry about it. If I fail, then it just gives me a greater reliance on the man that put me here anyway. One of the things that Charlie is um, experimenting with, I'm going to tattle on him a little bit, just for two minutes, is that we've, we've been sort of programmed into certain patterns of thought, like we have to get to this topic in a hurry, state of the dead, Sabbath, other things. And, and we've been asking God, we've been working together in our study groups at home at, at Colville Church and uh, in the personal ministry. Charlie leads family ministries, uh, I'm personal ministry leader, and we're working with all the other ministry leaders to really just work on this concept of what if we said, God, please just help us learn how to do Jesus' methods. What was it again? Mingled among men as one who desired their good. Won their confidence, or that's the third one, what was the second one? Uh, no, uh, oh, he took interest in them, that's my words for it, right? He cared about them, and then, and then he won their confidence, those are the three things. Well, Lord, what if, what if we just say, you know, this is not in us to do it, because we're too busy trying to put everybody in cookie cutters and fill the pews. We just need to learn how to love people. And, and Lord, help us to see, help us to find how to love them. I don't mean love them like just leave them in their dilemma, like, I love you, have a good day. Uh, not that some people are referring to it as this soft, mushy love that never tells, teaches truth, you know, truth, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about love that's willing to help them, but you're going to have to hear them to know what their question is. And sometimes we're so busy rolling answers, we haven't even figured out what their question is yet. And so we're, we're, we're just asking, Lord, teach us how to care enough about them that we hear their heart, we hear their questions, and, and then we start asking the Lord for, for wisdom as we read his word, as we behold him and his character, which we're going to do all weekend, uh, how to apply that at like, like healing ointment to their hurt, to their wound, to their question, to their crisis, to their family situation, whatever it is. And, and, and you know, if the pastor, for instance, was going to tell us tonight at our meeting that, uh, let's say, in two months we're going to have... An evangelistic seminar, he's going to do the sermoning up front, right? Then the most important part, besides that he's got to prayerfully prepare himself for that, is that all of us get ready to minister to the people who the Lord brings. And from now until then, that's only two months, that we every day don't get so busy, so caught up in life, that we're not reaching out and ministering to the ones right next to us, right near us, in the grocery store, on the sidewalk, in the apartment next door, whatever it is, with the loaves of bread and the ministering to the, the, the young families and the pregnant girls and all of that stuff. Because that's where their heart is touched by friendship and love that will interest them in hear, hearing anything that you or the pastor is going to have to say. That is how he intends the army to work. Let me describe it to you this way. What if, what if tomorrow morning, starting tomorrow morning, 7 o'clock, you had a new job, okay? You're done with your old job. This is your new job. And here's how this job works. Uh, you get the food that you need, no extra. And you get the clothes that you need, no extra. Should we add shoes that you need, no extra? <laughs> I mean, you know, you get the point. But here's your job. Every morning, you get to go into the throne room with a, as big a bag as you can bring. And the, the king of kings is going to fill it up with everything needed to help people heal in their hearts all day long. And you get to use it all day long. And it'll never run out until the end of the day. And then when you're done and the sack is empty, you get your meal, just what you need. You get to sleep, just the amount you need. And then tomorrow morning, you get to go in and get that bag filled up again and go again. If that isn't interesting to us, it would only be because we still think it's about conquering some earthly kingdom. Because that is the mission, that is the job. And here's what's exciting to me. That's how the angels live. All day. It says all heaven has stopped. 
There's no business, no commerce going on in heaven. The angels aren't busy on some other croquet game or some other activity of buying and selling. Right? They have one mission all day, round the clock, 24-7. I don't, I don't even think they sleep. And what is it? To go into the throne room, get the bag filled up, and then come down here and minister to us all day, all the time, watching over us, hoping we'll, like the disciples of old, get it. And that we'll turn away from this conquering the world thing and living in castles that we need to build up on this earth as if we don't have one in heaven that's already prepared for us. Spending time, right, just, just letting it all get consumed, time that is, so that we're too busy to actually do what our master employer has offered us as far as a job and occupation. And we're just, so we're just asking those things at home. And I'm having fun sort of just as watching as Jonathan builds this little website about the fishing group. I thought, well, that's a cool name. And, you know, reading whatever's there. And, and, and I'm just inviting you to, to drink in what I'm saying. Now, we're gonna, the rest of the weekend, we're going to repeat some of what we said tonight. But it's going to be all on the same thing because it's going to be majorly focused on what God is like and how he ministers to us. So that by studying that pattern, we can have then what will minister to others. And if you just drink that in here at this church and say, well, how about we take this challenge? Here's a challenge that we put out at Colville at our church. Just take, find, ask the Lord, spend some time here. Here's our prayer part, right? So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And we're going to say, Lord, give me one family in the church and one family outside the church to serve and minister in whatever way you inspire me to do. You don't have to figure that out all in the first week. You don't have to figure out the how. And, and, and what's amazing is if we'll let the, we're learning, if we let the Lord help us learn on one family inside, one family out, that as it actually starts working, meaning we're changed, pretty soon you know how many hungry people there are? A whole lot more than one inside and one outside. But even at our church, I watch how some of them sit in the pews and look at me like, what's he talking about? <laughs> and th it doesn't happen for them. They'll go a whole nother week, do the busy thing, get the stuff done, show up worn out, fall asleep halfway through the sermon, and they're not having it. The heavens are shut up. They're closed up. The Lord closes. I'm going I'm to leave some more of this for Saturday night, but I'm going to just clo close with this idea. The Lord closes them up, so to speak, for our good. Why? How does that good for us? Oh, if you didn't, you think you're doing something right. <laughs> How is that good for us? Because he wants us to realize how empty and dry it is without him. How completely incapable we are without him. We have to. That's what the disciples had to get. They had to deny Christ just to get that. It's amazing to me that God would be okay with his chief uh, disciple uh, just denying him three times and cussing and swearing. And, and that's okay with God? He, he even told Peter he's going to do it before he did it. It's only okay with God because God loves Peter. He's not all worked up about how bad that's going to make him, Jesus, look that night. I mean, right, that's what I'd have been thinking all this time, three and a half years, and now you're, you're not making me look very good. My ministry, my work, all this, I've done, I've done, right? Not Jesus. Jesus says he needs to go through that. He needs to find out without me he can do so that tomorrow... When he wakes up after the tears and he's thought about it and he's realized how nothing he is, then he can fully surrender his heart to God. And then he became opening speaker on the day of Pentecost. Right? That's what, what this is about. So just some thoughts for you. Um, I encourage you to keep your fishing group meeting and talking and discussing. Most important, keep looking at what, what it's saying to us. Of the, of the how, the Jesus' methods. That's what we mean by, are we doing it his way yet? Jesus' methods. Don't, don't uh, just pass over that lightly. We do a lot of methods that don't follow his. We do a lot of programs and do a lot of activities that don't match his, right? So we have to figure that out. And, and, and we don't want it to turn into a contention thing, you know, elder against elder, people against pastor, board against whatever, right? That, then the devil's winning on all sides. We must accept the fact that, wait a minute, the Lord has called us to be one with each other as he was one with his Father, not by human power, but by our transformed hearts, realizing that this is not about us. I mean, yes, it is about my life and my eternity, 
as a tiny little, tiny little piece of the whole story, which I'm most interested in too often, but it is really, it is really about God and what he's like and what he can do with us fallen sinful humans in totally transforming us and revealing to the world. Here's what the guy in the Islamic seminar said to us. He said, Islam, the, the Muslims are waiting to see a true Christian. And really, it's not just Muslims. There are Christians who are waiting to see a true Christian. The world needs to see God working in our life. Pastor, close it up for us. Good. The definition of the agape love is a charity love, is a giving love. The problem that we typically see is that we are trying to love God in a way of humanity and ignoring or pushing away agape love. The truth is, agape love simply is a charity love, a giving love. We empty out, we, God poured out Himself upon us. That's, <coughs> agape love. That's right. If Amen. But if we get it, we are poured out upon humanity. That's right. And the very fact that we do, if we do anything for the fact of our own personal gain, we do it for our pride, we do it to fill the pews, we do it mm -hmm. for whatever reason, outside of simply pouring out ourselves of the agape love to the world, that, that love that says, I love you so much that I, if you never change, I'll still love you. But I love you so much, I don't want to leave you in that state. I want you to Better than that. Amen. That's a godly love. Amen. It's a poured out love. And that's, a, that's only a God love. Thank you. That's great. That's I, I just think that, you know, that to me is that, that, that concept is, is what evangelism really is, is taking that love to the world and saying, I want to introduce you to a God who poured out his life, his son to me. For us. That's right. And here's the scary piece for those of us in leadership, whatever that is. <laughs> it's scary to say, wait a minute, you mean that if our people aren't running out, you remember the bag I was talking about? Just, just sharing God with people. It, it's really not because I'm not running the program. It's because they don't have Christ in the heart. It changes our focus it, for, for us, uh, the, it, again, using this word leaders. It changes the focus from, okay, what we need is another program or new programs or better programs. What it changes is, wait a minute, we need to help everybody in, in the, the building, right? Understand they're called to be ministers, Amen. not to be in charge, not to run and control things, but to serve, to be served. That's this agape love. And then suddenly you find yourself in Walmart and you're talking to somebody because you've run into them a few times before, somewhere else or whatever. And now you're standing at Walmart and you're having a conversation about the love of God. And then somebody else actually who just showed up in Walmart came over and now you got three people all standing. In Walmart? Can we have Bible studies in Walmart? <laughs> or on the street or in the church or in their home? Ellen White, I, last year I did a sort of for my own self an in-depth study on the, the term personal ministry because they asked me to be that and I'm like, oh, what's that? So I read it and she, here's what she says. We need... Personal ministry, personal ministry, personal ministry. Less sermonizing, which is why I'm going to stop talking now. And more personal ministry, more working with people heart to heart. That's the calling. That's what this church was called into action for. All connected to the, the love of God, filling us and then being revealed out from us. Let's have a prayer. Dearly Father, we do thank you for this time just to uh, stir some thoughts, to have you lift our hearts up to, to the amazing opportunity that you have for us to be yoked with you, to, to be right next to you, watching you work, studying how you're doing it, and then learning to say those words and to share that love that you have for us and now through us to other people. This miracle we ask you for because it is according to your will and that you, you want to give it to us like a, a parent longs to give good gifts. And we thank you that you brought us here just to think about these things tonight from our different various homes so that we could get together and pray and ask for your blessing, your guidance, 
and for this miracle of, of change in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.